So um, thank you for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yingning, and today I'm going to talk about parishioners, uh, our conditionally accepted PODI work on garbage-free reference counting with reuse. This is joint work with Alex, Leo, and Dan. And I'm a final year PhD student from the University of Hong Kong. So work is, since this work is about reference counting, I would like to give a brief introduction to reference counting. As a way to do garbage collection, the idea of reference counting is quite simple. Reference counting keeps track of, like for each resource, a count of the numbers of the resource for it to, uh, uh, to it held by other resource. So if the resource is being referred by an other resource, for example, if it is put into a list, then the reference count is incremented. And if it loses wrong resources, then that resource counter is decremented. When the reference count reaches to zero, the memory held by this resource is then freed. Reference counting is a popular technique because of its low memory overhead, and it is easy to implement. It has been used in languages like Swift, Python, and shared pointers in C++. However, there are at least three known problems that make the reference counting operations expensive in practice. That is, common reference counting systems are not precise and hold on to objects too long. Also, when multiple threads share a data structure, reference count operations need to be atomic, which is very expensive. Furthermore, if an object re references for a cycle, the runtime needs to be handled them separately. Because of these reasons, the, this field has broadly moved in favor of generational cheesy collectors. In this work, we want, to take, we want to take a fresh look at reference counting. Specifically, we consider a program language design that gives strong compile time guarantees in order to enable efficient reference counting at runtime. In the context of the COCA programming language, an eager functional language using multiple data types together with a strong type and effect system. In particular, precise reference counting is our main contribution, and we show we mitigate the impact of concurrency and cycles. The rest of the talk is organized as follows. We will first talk about Perseus which stands for precise reference counting with reuse and specialization. We then give a brief introduction to COCA and show how strong static guarantees at compile time can further allow pressures to be integrated with non-trivial language features. Thirdly, we show how pressures leads to a new programming paradigm that we call FBIP, which stands for functional but in place. Finally, we talk about the underlying theoretical foundation of pressures our linear resource calculus, lambda 1. We start with Perseus. To see why we need precise, a precise reference counting, we first claim that common reference counting implementations might retain memory longer than needed. To illustrate the issue, suppose we have a polymorphic map function that applies a function f to each element of a list xs. And we have a function for which simply creates a large list, and then increment every element in the list and prints the list. Now, many compilers emit reference counting code similar to this. Here, the job xs operation decrements the reference count of the object, and if it drops to zero, recursively drops all children of the object and frees its memory. Here, we notice that the common reference counting implementations tie the liveness of a reference to its lexical scope. This scope, the lifetime reference counts, are used by the C++ shared pointers, references RC, and NIM. And while it is not required by the semantics, Swift typically emits code like this as well. Implementing reference counting this way is straightforward. But from a performance perspective, this technique is not always optimal. In this example, the large list xs is retained in memory while a new large list ys is built. Both exist for the duration of print, after which a very long cascade chain of job operation happens for each element in each list. Now, the question is, can we do better? 
For reference counting to be precise, we want the job resources, uh, we want to job resources as soon as possible. Now, before printing Ys, Xs will have been dropped. Precious takes a more aggressive approach where ownership of references is passed down to each function. Now, no job operations are emitted inside for as math is in charge of freeing XS and YS is freed by print. Now, let's take a look at what, how Precious will transform this math function then. Before we proceed, we slightly reformat map for the changes to be easy to see. For this example, Perseus first does dump and jump insertion. In the cast branch, first the head and the tail of the list are dumped. And when, uh, where a dump X operation increments the reference count of an object and returns itself. The job XS then frees the initial list node. We need to dump F as well as it's used twice while X and XX are consumed by F and MAP, respectively. At first blush, this seems more expensive by the, uh, than the scoped approach. But as we will see, this change enables many further optimizations. More importantly, transferring ownership means we can free an object immediately when no more references remain. For MAP, uh, the memory usage is halved. The list XS is deallocated while the new list is being allocated. Once we change to precise reference based, uh, ownership based reference counting, there are many optimization opportunities. After the dump job insertion, we perform a job speciali specialization pass. The basic job operation is defined as follows in pseudocode. If the resource is unique, we will drop all its children and free it. Otherwise, we will decrement its reference count. Job specialization essentially inlines the job operation spe uh, specialized at a specific constructor. We need to be a little bit smart with the job specialization, though. In particular, we only apply job specialization if the children are used. So in this case, we will specialize the job XS instruction. And it, it becomes code like this. Now we can perform another transformation where we push down the dump operation into branches. In the first branch, we apply the standard dump jump fusion where corresponding dump jump pairs are removed. And we then push dump into the second branch. And we end up with this code. Now, almost all reference count operations in the fast pass are gone. In our example, every node in this list XS that we map over is unique, and so the if test always succeeds, thus immediately freeing the node without any further uh, reference counting. The code now already seems pretty good, but there is more we can do. Here, we are freeing XS and immediately allocating a fresh const node. Instead of doing so, can we try to reuse the memory of XS instead? In particular, we go back to the code after the first transformation of dump jump insertion. From there, besides dump jump insertion, in the first pass, we can also perform reuse analysis before we emit the initial reference counting operations. Reuse analysis analyzes each mesh branch and it tries to pair each mesh pattern to allocated constructors of the same size in, the, in that branch. In the map example, XS is paired with the counts constructor. When such pairs are found, instead of jump, we generate a jump reuse operation that returns a reuse token that we attach to the constructor paired with it. The counts at reuse token annotation means that at runtime, if this reuse token is not null, then we can reuse it directly instead of allocating fresh memory for the counts node. Just like jump specialization, we can now perform jump reuse specialization. Recall the definition of jump. In jump reuse, instead of freeing X, 
we will return the address of x. After job reuse specialization, we will get code like this. And like before, we can now push down the dumps and fuse the dump jump pairs. We end up with this code. Note that in the first pass, where XS is uniquely owned, there are no more reference counting operations at all. Furthermore, the memory of XS is directly reused to provide the memory for the count node for this returned list. This page summar summarizes all the transformation. We started with the reference counted program on the left. After all the transformation, we end up with the code on the right. We have achieved precise reference counting where a resource is freed as soon as it is not used. Further, we are able to reuse memory that saves lots of reference counting operations. And that's the key idea of Perseus. Before I proceed, let me check whether there are any questions regarding all the transformations. OK, everyone's good. So now we move to the second part of this talk, where we give a brief introduction to COCA and show how strong static guarantees at compile time allow Perseus to be integrated with other language features. COCA is a strongly typed functional style language with algebraic effects. Algebraic effects are a unifying language abstraction that is able to express composable and modular computational effects. Consider defining the div uh, division function. If we define the div function this way, when m is 0, we will get a divided by 0 error at runtime. Using algebraic effects, we can define the div function as this. We first define an effect exception, which has a single operation fail. Now in the definition of div, when the second argument is 0, we perform the operation fail. Importantly, we keep track of the effect the function may perform in its type signature. Such system is called an effect type system. And in such a system, we can guarantee that all algebraic effects are handled properly. Notice that the perform does not specify explicitly how this fail operation should be handled. In algebraic effects, the semantics of operation is given by effect handlers. For example, we can easily define three applications to div using different handlers. In the first case, we turn the div result into a maybe result. So when divided by zero, we will get a nothing, or otherwise we will wrap the result inside the just constructor. In the second case, we resume the original computation with zero. So one divided by zero would return zero instead. We can even resume a computation multiple times. In the last case, we somehow want to resume the original computation twice with zero and return the sum of it. Note how using algebraic effects, we can define three different implementations using the same underlying logic, but just with different handlers. Now we discuss how with such a strong effect type system, we can deal with other issues of reference counting. Here, we emphasize again that Perseus precise reference counting is our main contribution. The strong effect type system helps mitigate the impact of concurrency and cycles. But this work does not yet present a general solution to all problems with reference counting. And the future work is required to see, for example, how cycles can be handled more efficiently. First, we talk about nonlinear control flow. An essential requirement of our approach is that programs have explicit control flow so that it is possible to statically determine where to insert dump and jump operations. However, it is in tension with functions that have nonlinear control flow. For example, if this f raises an exception, then the xx and f will leak and never be jumped. In COCA, we guarantee all control flow is compiled to explicit control flow, 
So our reference count analysis does not have to take nonlinear control flow into account. This is achieved through effect typing. As we have seen, every effect has an effect type, every function has an effect type that signifies if it can throw exceptions or not. Functions that can throw exceptions are compiled into functions that return with an explicit error type that is, uh, that is either OK or error if an exception is thrown. This is checked and propagated at every invocation. At this point, all errors are explicitly propagated and all control flow is explicit again. The example here is specialized for exceptions, but actually COCA implementation uses a generalized version of this technique to implement a multi-prompt delimited control to express general algebraic effects. Now we move to concurrency. If multiple threads share a same uh, re a reference to a resource, the reference count needs to be incremented and decremented using atomic operations, which can be very expensive. In COCA, the strap system gives us additional guarantees about which variables may need atomic operations. Specifically, following the solution of Lin, we mark each object with whether it can be thread shared or not. And the supply an internal polymorphic function T share, which marks every uh, which marks any object and its children recursively as being thread shared. And all objects start out as non-thread shared and are only marked through explicit operations. The jump and the dump operation can be implemented efficiently by avoiding atomic operations in the first pass by checking the thread shared flag. For example, Job may be implemented in C as this. If only is thread shared, we will use atomic operations. Or otherwise, in the first pass, we will directly update the reference count. In COCA, we can further encode the, re the reference count for thread shared objects as a negative value. This enables us to use a single inline test to see if we can use a fast inline pass for the common case. The drop check function here checks if the reference count is one well and releases it, or otherwise it adjusts the reference count atomically. Mutation in COCA is done through explicit multiple references. Here we look at first class multiple references. A multiple reference cell is created with ref, where each operation has a stateful effect in some heap H and returns a first class reference containing a value of type A. We can then read and update a reference using the functions respectively. However, when a multiple reference style is thread shared, this presents a problem as the read operation may race with the update operation. In particular, suppose the read operation first reads the current reference in X. But before dump, the thread is suspended and the other thread reads to the same reference. It will read the same object into Y, update the reference, and then drop Y. And if Y has a reference count of 1, it will be freed. When the other thread resumes, it will now try to dump the just freed object. To make this work properly, we need to perform both operations atomically which can be very expensive. Fortunately, in our setting, we can avoid the slope path in most cases. First of, first of all, as we will see, since FVIP allows for the efficiency of in-place updates with a purely a functional specification, we expect multiple references to be used less commonly in COCA. Secondly, as just discussed, we can also check if a multiple reference is actually thread shared. And if not, we can avoid the, uh, the atomic code pass. But multiple references can create an other problem. That is, if we initialize a resource with an other resource, and then later update the original resource with the later one, we will create a cycle. Reference counting can never release cycles, as both resources will have non-zero non reference count. In COCA, like many functional programming languages, 
almost all data types are immutable, and such data types are never uh, cyclic. Since multiple references are uncommon in our setting, for now, we leave the responsibility for the programmer to break cycles. This strategy is also used in languages like Swift. In the future, we expect to generate code that checks mul uh, mul uh, multiple data types at the runtime and that may perform a more efficient code collection. You can play with COCA following this link, where we have detailed instructions on how to install and how to use COCA and how Perseus works inside COCA. The type system of COCA is well described in the Purple 17 paper. The compilation techniques of general algebraic effects into multi-prompt delimited control is described in our recent SAP20 paper and later improved in our under-submission work, which can be found now as a technical report. Um, so now we will move to the third part of the talk, FBIP, functional but in place. So we get the best of both words. To understand the idea of FBIP, let's resume our previous running example of MAP. We can apply a final transformation. That is, just like we specialize job and job reuse, we can specialize reuse itself to get reuse specialization. In particular, the definition of reuse is given as this. If the reuse token is not now, we can update the fields in place. With reuse specialization, we get this code. However, for our map example, there would be no benefit to specializing as all fields are updated. Thus, we only specialize constructors if at least one of the fields stays the same. In that case, by reuse specialization, we are able to further reuse unchanged fields of a construct. As an example, we consider insertion into a red-black tree. The definition of red-black tree is well known, right? So each node is either red or black. The root and all leaves are black. If a node is red, then its children are black. The red-black tree has the environment that every pass from the root to any of the leaves goes through the same number of black nodes. With such property, people prove that search, deletion, and insertion in red-black tree can all be done in all log n time. In 1993, Okasaki shows how to encode the red-black tree in a functional setting. Here, we consider red-black tree insertion. When inserting nodes, the environments need to be maintained by rebalancing the tree when needed. For example, Consider we insert 19 into the tree. In the algorithm, we always start with a red node and rebalance the tree as necessary. Okasaki's algorithm implements this elegantly and functionally. For this kind of program, reuse specialization is effective. For example, if we look at the second branch in this function, we see that the newly allocated node has almost all the same fields as the original node, T, except for the left tree, L, which now becomes ins LKB, similar for the rest of cases. Now we focus on this second branch. Because of the matching between the pattern and the new, allocate, uh, new constructor, we will apply reuse analysis. After reuse analysis, this branch becomes like this where we try to reuse the node t. Now notice that we have a partial update here. So we can further apply reuse specialization, which will give us this code. We can see how effectively we have reused uh, unchanged fields of the construct, as we have only updated the changed part, that is the left tree in this case. And this functional branch in, turns into an in-place mutation. I hear some question. Yes. So this is really nice. Um, but I notice here that you're first saying uh, it is unique. And then later you say um, if it's null. But those 
the second test is pre predetermined by the first. So you thought of doing a bit of extra fusion here. You mean um, when we do this reuse analysis, actually this one will become a pointer if if and only if the resource t is unique. Right. So later the constructor will check whether this one is a noun or not. And only if this t is unique, this pointer will not be noun. But if it's not, then you cannot actually reuse the memory. So it we will just return noun in this case. Right, but you if you go back to when you had two if then else's on the page, you'll see that you in the second one, you're branching on something you already know from the first. So you might do, I think you need to go forward rather than backward there. Oh. Back here. There. Right, so you see the first one says if is unique. And then the second one says, mm -hmm. are you not equal to null? But the second one could be avoided if you push stuff inside the first one, couldn't it? Yes, I think so, yes. If this test is true, then this test will also be true. Yes, exactly. you are exactly right, yes. So have you thought about doing that merge? Right. I think we can, of course, do that. And we should probably try it out. We haven't done this yet in the current implementation. OK. While I'm speaking, I will also say that I really love your icon for reuse. Who did that? Uh, which one? The at Ru? The, the Yao and Ying pussycats. Oh, <laughs> I found it online. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yes, I love it. Um, great. How can I erase all the markers? Well, maybe I will just go to the next slide. Yes. Um, so we can see here how effectively we have reused unchanged fields of a construct. And we have only updated the changed part. So it turns out we can transform the whole red flag tree insertion into the same, uh, with the same strategy. And this example shows us that with Perseus, we can write functional algorithms that dynamically adapt to, to use in-place mutation when possible. This style of programming leads to a new paradigm that we call FBIP, functional but in-place. To illustrate the effectiveness of FBIP, we consider an application. In 1968, Canus posted the problem of visiting a tree in order without using extra stack or heap space. Since then, numerous solutions have appeared in the literature. A particular elegant solution was proposed by Morris. It's beyond this talk to give a full explanation of Morris's algorithm. But here we show its implementation in C. The key idea of Morris's algorithm is that it is an in-place mutating algorithm that swaps pointers in the tree to remember which paths are unvisited. We can derive a functional and more intuitive solution using the FBIP technique. We start by defining an explicit visitor data structure that keeps track of which parts of the tree we still need to visit. We also keep track of which direction we are going, either up or down. We ignore all the details, but its key implementation simply relies on pattern matches on directions, trees, and visitors. Looking at each branch, we can see that being matches to a big R, which is of the same size, Bing R matches to Bing L, and also Bing L matches to Bing. So if the is unique with reuse analysis, each branch updates the tree nodes in place at the wrong time without any allocation. Furthermore, since all T map codes are tail codes, this also compares to a tight loop. 
Therefore, what we have achieved is when a unique tree is passed, the purely functional specification will adapt at runtime into an in-place updating algorithm with a tight loop that needs no extra stack or heap space. This page clearly shows the comparison between the two implementations. On the left, we have Morris's traversal in C, and on the right, we have FBIP implementation in COCA. Now, let's talk about the final piece of this work, the linear resource calculus. Previously, we showed how the compiler turns a program into a program annotated with reference counting instruction. Now, we can take a closer look at what's inside this compiler. Of course, we have Perseus implemented inside it. But Perseus is really just the syntax-directed algorithm of Lambda 1. The design of Lambda 1 is closely based on linear logic, and we have its operational semantics in an explicit heap with reference counting. In the formalism of Lambda 1, we start with essentially an untyped Lambda calculus extended with explicit binding and pattern match. And it elaborates uh, into expressions with explicit dump and drop annotations. Notably, to capture the essence of precise reference encoding, uh, in reference counting, Lambda 1 does not model multiple references. The elaboration process is captured in this judgment. In this judgment, we have two contexts which, re, uh, which keep track of resources in scope. Delta is a borrowed context, and gamma is the owned context. The judgment transforms E into an expression E prime with explicit reference counting operations. To illustrate how the elaboration works, let's work through some rules. The key idea of Lambda 1 is that each resource in the owned context is consumed exactly once. So in the variable rule, we can consume a resource if and only if we own this resource exactly once in the owned context. And this is the only resource we own, so we have already consumed all the other resources in the context. Similarly, in the Lambda rule, for ownership-based uh, passing semantics, we must own all the free variables of lambda and own them exactly once in the owned context. Since each resource can be consumed exactly once, a resource needs to be explicitly duplicated if it is needed more than once. In this rule, we have x either borrowed or owned, and after explicit dump, we increase the occurrence of x in the owned context. Duly, a resource must be explicitly dropped if it's not needed, and we will remove it from the owned context. Moreover, the app rule splits the owned context into two separate contexts, uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2, for expression E1 and E2 respectively. Each expression then consumes its corresponding owned environment. Since gamma 2 is consumed in the E2 derivation, we know that resources in gamma 2 are surely alive when deriving E1. And thus, we can borrow gamma 2 in the E1 derivation. We will skip the rest of the rules, but I hope this brief introduction gives you some sense about how this system works. Now, we can present Perseus as syntax-directed linear resource rules. The judgment maintains more invariants that we will keep holding uh, during the derivations. In particular, Perseus rules are set to do precise reference counting, so we delay up operation to come as late as possible, and we generate a job operation as soon as possible. As an example, unlike the app rule, the Perseus S app rule now deterministically finds a good split of uh, the environment gamma. In particular, we pass the intersection of gamma with the free variables in E2 as gamma 2 to the derivation of E2, and passes the rest uh, to E1. Also, for lambdas, 
Precious detects whether the binding is actually used in the free variable uh, as the free variables in the body, and immediately drops the uh, variable if it's not used. And I encourage people to read our paper if you are interested to see more formalism. Now we can define our target semantics of a reference counted heap. So sharing of resources becomes explicit. The judgment says that an expression E under a heap H steps, in, steps into an other expression E prime under uh, the heap H prime. Specifically, we have three sets of operational rules. The first set of rules for lambdas and constructors allocate resources in the heap. The second set of rules does beta reduction for applications, pattern matches, and variable bindings with necessary reference counting instructions inserted. For example, for lambdas, since it's ownership uh, passing based, we will dump all, these, uh, all, all its resources in the generated expression. The final set of the rule reduces reference counting instructions in a standard way. We we'll dump increments re references, jump decrements references, and when the reference counts jumps to zero, we free the resource from the uh, resources from the heap and recursively jump its children. With all the definitions ready, we can now prove that Perseus is precise and garbage free. To be able to give the definition of precision, we first define the notion of reachability. We say that a resource X is reachable in terms of a heap H and expression E if X is a free variable of E, or from another reachable re uh, resource Y, X is reachable from the resource, uh, resource V bound to Y. So essentially, reachable variables correspond to variables that are being actively used in this program. Now we can prove that Perseus is precise and garbage free. So if Perseus elaborates an expression E into E prime, and E prime steps into uh, the a variable X under the heap H, then we can prove that for every intermediate state HI and EI in this derivation, which is not at a reference counting operation, we will shortly see how it, uh, what it means, we can prove that all the resources in the uh, domain of the heap is actually reachable from the erased uh, expression EI. Well, this, this notation just erased a reference counting operation uh, from the expression EI. In order to see how we, uh, why we need this erasure, uh, consider this example. In this example, we have a heap which has only one resource y. And in this expression, we just apply the identity function to the job y and the unit expression. This expression is not precise because y is jumped too late. It is only dropped after the lambda gets allocated. So in this case, y is reachable from the program, but not from the erased program. So this program uh, is not precise. In contrast, Perseus will accept expressions like this. So in this expression, we will have a drop y before we allocate the lambda. This is an expression at a reference counting operation. So we will wait until all the reference counting operations are done, and in this case, after uh, it, the expression takes a step, we will drop y from the heap. And we can then apply theorem 4 and show that, yes, this expression is indeed precise and garbage free. So in summary, uh, in the first part of the talk, we have introduced the Perseus, which does precise reference counting with reuse and uh, specialization. On top of it, we show how we can uh, use, um, uh, we, how we use a new programming paradigm, FBIP, which stands for functional, but in place, so you get the best of both words. And Precious is really built on top of a linear resource calculator, Lambda 1. And all these are implemented in the COCA programming language. Finally, we discuss initial benchmarks of Precious as implemented in COCA versus state-of-the-art memory uh, reclamation implementations in various other languages. Since we compare across languages, 
we need to uh, interpret the results with care. The results depend not only on memory, uh, rel uh, memory mem uh, management techniques, but also on the different optimizations performed by each compiler and how well we can translate each benchmark into that particular language. So we view this result, therefore, mostly as evidence that Perseus is viable and can be competitive, but not as a direct comparison of the absolute performance between systems. The benchmarks are all chosen to be medium-sized and non-trivial, and all stress memory allocation with little computation. Most of these are based on the benchmark suite of Lin, and all are available in the COCA repository. We can see from the benchmarks that even though COCA has very few optimizations besides the reference counting ones, it performs quite well compared to these mature, uh, mature systems. In particular, the difference between COCA and COCA no op shows the effectiveness of reused analysis and specialization, where COCA no op is the implementation of COCA without reuse and reuse analysis. Especially in the RB tree, where COCA no op is more than twice as slow. And with that, I'm happy to conclude this talk and take any further questions. Thank you, Sam. Can you hear me this time? Yep. Yes. Uh, right. Sorry about before. I, I don't know what happened. I seem to lose my audio. Uh, I'm just maybe you can even see me as well if the video is working. Or maybe that's a bad idea. Uh, okay. You you still hear me? Yes. Good. <laughs> Um, so I, I just, uh, yeah, first, well, I see Pana saying lovely stuff. I, I quite agree. This is really nice work. Um, but let me first try and ask the question I was trying to ask earlier, which was um, you mentioned that the restriction with um, cycles and references, and basically you said that the, the programmer has to manage that for themselves. I was, I was wondering what, what mm -hmm. happens uh, if they don't, if you do have a cycle. Uh, the memory will leak. It'll, it'll leak memory, but um, yes. nothing else. Hopefully nothing else, because memory leak is horrible enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. OK, OK, right. So you just have to try and make sure you, you don't have a memory leak. But um, what happens if yeah. you genuinely do mm -hmm. need a cyclic data structure? You just can't do it. There's no way around that at the moment. Yeah. Um, so for now, I think because of the uh, F5 technique, so we can you should actually avoid using uh, multiple variables in most uh, in almost all the cases if uh, possible. And if you do need uh, to use like uh, multiple uh, data structures and create cycles, then you must be careful that you should break the cycles by yourself. But that said, this is also like uh, at the very early stage of COCA. Because in the future, we do plan to implement a, like, a cycle collector for COCA and also see whether like, with all the strong static guarantee, we can actually implement the cycle collector more efficiently. So yeah, I was, I was wondering, that was my next question, was, was um, uh, is it, will that be like a, a sort of standard garbage collector or, or something else? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are many standard garbage collector or like cycle detectors like, like implemented in all the other languages. We will probably start with those uh, implementations, but we will see like whether we can actually do better because, you know, COCA is a functional program language and with all this effect type system. So we hope that uh, with all the static guarantee, we can have a more efficient implementation. But this is really just future work. Right, right. OK, that's very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Sam? Other Sam, that's this time. <laughs> Thanks, great talk. Um, I wondered whether you'd measured things like the memory utilization of, say, the Glasgow Haskell compiler. Um, because I know even though it's slow, it does do quite a lot of aggressive memory optimization. So I wondered whether you can definitively say that 
um, it isn't able to free things early and it has to wait for the full garbage collector, for example? Oh, right. Um, that's a great question. So actually, you can probably also see the paper now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, in the paper, we have done uh, the benchmark uh, on the memory usage. And we can still see that COCA actually performs very competitive compared to other languages. So in terms of Haskell, um, yeah, the for most of the cases. Right. Yeah, yes. And we think that's because of the uh, memory uh, uh, reuse, because of reuse analysis. So COCA can aggressively reuse the memories that you are going to free. So we can effectively use less memory than other languages. But that being said, it also the results uh, again, the results also depend on all the other language features and all the other implementation details of the language. So uh, we must be careful not to say yeah, that Coca performs better. I wonder if you can just go into the source of uh, some of these compilers, especially I think uh, Glasgow Haskell compiler is the most likely culprit for doing these sorts of optimizations and seeing whether they do anything similar, but perhaps just less effectively. Right. Um, that would be interesting to see. And uh, we haven't done that um, for every language, but we do believe that if we like look at the generated code for that language and maybe carefully tuning the program, we can actually get a better performance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Brian. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you'd looked at uh, Martin Hoffman's linear functional programming language at any point. I guess it's a kind of static counterpart to to your dynamic optimizations. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we have actually so discussed in the paper like uh, one closely related work to this work will be uh, languages with linear types or unique types like in linear calculus, linear Haskell, mm -hmm. right. But the difference would be uh, all those linear types, they enforce the linear restriction statically. Yeah. So for example, if you want to implement a function, you must have one version which works for linear types and other version which works for any types. And in our case, this reuse analysis is really dynamic. We use the dynamic information to see whether we reuse certain memory if the resource is unique. But you can easily imagine that these two techniques can be combined. So if we have linear types in COCA, let's and those resources will be unique. And then we can effectively re reuse all those memories like without doing all the runtime uh, reuse analysis. One other uh, question. Right, that's the like a difference and the possible combination. Mm -hmm. So I was also wondering if you'd looked at um, region memory management as a comparison as well. So the um, ML kit, standard ML implementation, uh, uses region memory management. So it deallocates large uh, groups of things at a time. And that might have a different performance in an interesting way. Oh. We we uh, we were not aware of that work, but we will take a look. Yeah, it's probably pretty easy to translate your OCaml examples into standard ML and see how it performs. Yeah, nice. yeah, right. Yes. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, last question from Phil. Right. Um, so again, I think that was nice. I agree with. Um, Connor's comment that's lovely stuff. In the um, Lambda 1 stuff, that, that looked reasonably elegant compared to how these things are sometimes written down. You use names like um, borrow a lot, which makes it sound a lot like what they do in Rust. Is it, could you use Lambda 1 to explain Rust or is it just the names are similar and the concepts are similar, but they're not the same concepts? Um. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the concept would be similar, but the way we do uh, manage uh, uh, memory management is very dif uh, different. So we, here we use the um, 
borrowed uh, context in order to drop resources as early as possible. But in Rust, they, oh, they still tie the scope, uh, the liveness of a resources to its scope. So even if you can have borrowed uh, resources and own the resources, you will still drop uh, resources too late. So I, I think like there are some similarities in the concept, but in terms of the implementations and what we want to do, that's very different. OK. Um, I won't ask you to go into that more now, but maybe a little bit of explanation of the similarities and differences would be helpful to some of your audience who's interested in both Rust and what you're doing. Um, but you know that's fair enough, right? Things aren't always the same. Um, but it'd be interesting to understand whether there's a close right, relationship yes. there, or you know, sometimes things look really similar, but they're just not quite the same. There's not a good fit, and be interesting to know which of these situations we're in. Right. Right, exactly. And one of our future work is also to explore the uh, borrowed context uh, further. And maybe at that point, we will know more about the relation between our technique with Rust. But I do believe maybe uh, Rust can also borrow. Well, I mean, there are some relation between these two uh, techniques, but further work needs to be done to see it explicitly. OK, anyhow, I think it's very nice work. And from this, I learned something very important, which should have been obvious, but I hadn't known before, right? So we, I think we all know that picking good names are important. But what I've learned <laughs> from this work is that picking a good icon is important as well, because I really uh, like the FBIP icon. <laughs>